Author's Corner, and this time I'm so excited to have with me Pastor Keith Battle. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Good. I'm glad to be here. Listen, I can hear you preaching this book, right? You can hear it. I can hear it because I know that you preach the Chickology, right? Yeah, I do. So I do. now you put this whole thing in book form. Talk about the purpose behind this whole thing. So the purpose is to talk about a very difficult topic that we don't tend to talk. We talk around it in church, but we don't directly address it to talk about it because it's so prevalent, not just in the world. It's prevalent in the body. It's prevalent in the church. And so I want to address it. And I've seen so many families ruined by it, by infidelity. So many people crushed and devastated. So many families dismantled. And, um, and I also have my own story of how we made it through that, through my infidelity, and it made our marriage stronger. That's something that people don't talk about. Like, what do you do after the, the, the trust has been shattered? Like, I really wanted to give people a map on how to rebuild trust when it's been shattered by infidelity, when trust has been destroyed. And so there, there are a number of motivations to it, but I would say at the end of the day, it's really to, to help address a topic, and it's somewhat humorous, but it's also serious because there are a lot of consequences that come with it. So that's some of the motivation and purpose behind it. I was, as I was reading and he came in, I said, I could hear you, you heard saying me. this. Like I could hear this, it's like conversational. It's really, you know, well, it's not conversational because it's like you just talking, right. but I could hear you saying it. It wasn't like, you know, a hard read, like you ready to get through the next chapter and see yeah. what's going on. And you like, you're so transparent in this book. So um, let's talk about infidelity. Just a, f a few uh, months ago, there was a uh, rumored about Pastor John Gray um, and infidelity, right? Mm -hmm. Where he talked about it with the congregation he had just been appointed to, right? And right. They had already, they'd already talked about it. it. You know, he'd already gotten a job, whatever. But now it's in the media. It's big. Now he's saying, he did an interview on The Real not too long ago that just said, I didn't have physical infidelity. I didn't have sex with this other woman. Okay. But I did let another woman in yeah. with regards to my relationship with my wife, which is what he wanted to share. And again, got blown out of proportion that he had a love child all of that mm -hmm. none of that was true okay but talk about the types of infidelity because he didn't have physical sex with another woman yeah um but it did happen in his marriage with regards to infidelity yeah because it doesn't oh it doesn't start with physical wow you know it can start virtually it can start with a social media relationship it can start by inappropriate conversation that crosses the line. That's a breach of integrity. That's a breach of fidelity. It can be emotional. Like our hearts connected. Like, man, we vibe. Like, I'm so sorry you're going through that. Man, your husband is lucky. Like, you could say something like that to a woman. You've all that's cheating. You 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 cheat. That's that's cold. Cause cause her husband doesn't feel like he's lucky, right? Or if you say, if you say to another man, your wife is such a lucky woman, right? Come on now, like, 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 why are you like saying that? Like your thoughts right? are already there, right? You know, that's not words. just harmless flirting, right? Right. We still got our clothes on, but was there a breach of trust? Yeah, because it, it's about motive and intention, where we want to see this go, and so there's, there's, I mean, some people can go and have a lap dance at a strip club. I was gonna say because people in marriages. You know, I, I want I don't want to say the believer, but some believers are, you know, people are, you know, this is my work husband. This is my, you know what I mean? Come on. <laughs> I like, like I would say this, how cool is your spouse with that? Really? Got it. You got a work husband? What does that mean? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? What does that mean? You know, um, and, and, and so, you know, there are levels of pornography to me is virtual infidelity. Like, like. There's no way, of, because for a man, when you masturbate particularly to an image, you're connecting with that image physiologically, psychologically, mentally. It, it creates a memory in your brain that's stored that you connect with. You can't, it's, 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 it sticks to the brain. That's why a person wants to go back to that. That's why they can, and that can actually, that can mess up the sex in a marriage because when you can go to a, you can go to a machine or a video or a, a television or a laptop or even a phone and enjoy yourself and pleasure yourself, you don't have to be a good communicator, you don't have to be financially responsible, you don't have to be compassionate, tender, you don't have to be romantic, but then you try to take that to a human right. 
And then she's saying, why don't you talk to me? Why don't you hold me? Why don't you pay your bills like you're supposed to? Why don't you bring your check home? And that's, you, you know, so, so you don't have to do any of that to have sex online. So it actually is training people to be disconnected, but to be sexual. And God didn't intend for sex to be disconnected. He intended it to be the deepest way that we can connect. And I think what, what a lot of sexual behavior does is it trains us to be, to objectify people and to use them for pleasure and not really connect with them in a pleasurable way. Does that make sense? It does, it does. That was pretty deep, I had to take a breath on that, right? <laughs> the side chickology, um, as I was reading, you wanted the, the uh, viewers or whoever was reading the book to know that when you're saying side chick, you're not just talking female Absolutely. or gender. Let's yeah. talk about that. This is, side chick is just a popular term, but they're side slicks too. Okay. Like, the, most side chicks are dealing with a dude. If it's a heterosexual infidelity or a heterosexual inappropriate relationship, it's usually a side slick too. It's a guy. Both people are being slick, but side chick is usually what it's called. They call a mistress, right? They call mistresses in the Bible or, or adulteress. But there's an adulterer for every adulteress. There's a mister for every mistress. There's a side slick for every side chick. And so it's not meant to be uh, condescending or chauvinistic. It's a book that's talking about infidelity. It's, the book is about cheating. And it's why men and women do it, not just why. And as you read through the book, you'll see that balance. It's a challenge to both men and women to be faithful to, to whoever you're supposed to be faithful to. That, and the, the introduction, leaves, yeah. that leaked out like the percentage of men that cheat and the percentage of women. Because, you know, women, all men are dogs. You yeah. know, you hear all of that. But it's like 57% and 54%. Like Real tight. Real close. <laughs> like we ain't cheating with ourselves necessarily. Yeah. There's always somebody available yeah. out there. I do think that men do cheat more than women. Yeah. I think statistically that's been proven that that it's, it's somewhere around a 7% gap over the ter entire lifespan of a person. So because they start tracking statistically people being unfaithful at 19 years old. How? I don't know. But you're unfaithful to your girlfriend or your, your boyfriend, right? Some people even get married that young. But, but, but the older we get at different time frames, there's a time between 19 to 29 that statistically that women are considered to be 1% more unfaithful than men between the ages of 19 to 29. Why that's the case, I don't know. It may be men just lying about it. Because here's the thing about statistics around infidelity. It's such a slick thing and a, and a dark thing that most people aren't even admitting it on an application. So when you get a survey, have you cheated? Nope. Like, yeah, <laughs> what's cheating? What's cheating? You mean, nah, I ain't did that. Like. Most people aren't being honest about it unless there has to be total anonymity. Yeah. But yeah, somewhere between 19 and 29, women are actually more apt to be unfaithful than a man for some reason. Wow. You know what I'm I started thinking back during those times. Yeah, way would back. always say. Yeah, you know? yeah, before the Lord really got a hold of me. Boy, he was in charge. He was, might have been my savior, but he wasn't my Lord. I wasn't really in the blood real deep. I had to go back and think about that. Yeah. And you know, it's you know, in the streets that tell you that, you know, if a woman cheats, she's a lot better at it. <laughs> so that that yeah. The guys. I you know I'm just saying what the streets say. So so I think so who's more careful, right? At the end of the day, who's sloppier? That's because, that's it. Because infidelity is a is a is a world of deception. Yeah. So it's not something I'd be proud of if I'm better at it. So I'm more deceptive than most people, but I think I think it I think it comes down more to personality and the way a person is wired. A person who's very detail oriented is very is harder to catch than a person who's just kind of loose anyway. Yeah, that's it. And you know, a person lose their phone, they leave stuff around, lose the keys all the time. They ain't gonna cheat long. <laughs> They're gonna get caught real quick. But I'm talking about the meticulous person whose life is ordered. And that's they have probably structured. Why they, say that. they have yeah. structured yeah. the infidelity in such a way that they have already dotted the eyes across the T's about where where this stuff got to go down. And so that person person is a lot less likely whether it's a male or a female to get caught than the person who's just generally not organized because it's really a very organized crime i say crime very lightly but it's a very organized behavior in order to get away with it and there are people who getting away with it for decades and nobody knew sometimes we find out at the funeral exactly this your mother too exactly you look just like her 
you. And nobody find out to the t- just some real stories out there. No, true story. My testimony. I found that I have a sister. Mm-hmm. Had a sister. My father passed when he was 44, really young. My dad. Yeah. Mom was 38. But I have found I had a sister on his deathbed. And that it was his he child. Had been, yep. That wow. he had, he had Nobody died. knew. Well, you didn't. Well, my grandfather knew, which is my father's, my mother's father. Wow. My mother's father and my father were like best friends. They bought our house and together. And he covered it for him. He covered it for yeah. him. And when my father got sick, he kept taking care of her. You wow. know what I mean? And my mother kind of knew. She said when she was born, she remembered the phone call. She knew. And, and she just told him, well, you better take care of him. And, she, and he did. Wow. He took care of her. Wow. And so I have a sister, yeah. you know. And, and, um, and yeah. it's not her fault. No, not at right? all. Not at all. I love her, yeah. you know, not at all. Because, yeah. you know, um, because, yeah, she, it wasn't her fault. Yeah. But all of that came out, Yeah. you know, during that time. And that was hard. But And think about your father's, your mother's father who kept it. The thing about, the thing about cheating is I think a lot of people don't consider all the people that cheating impacts. Because now you got people containing your story, yeah. trying to cover yeah. for you. That's a lot of work for people. Yeah, and the and the um, residual impact of what happened with my sister, because she, I mean, she holds. I mean, she really had a, a hard time because, you know, she was raised by her grandmother and my father, and so they when they both passed, you know, what I mean, then there you have this whole scenario. So the yeah. the, the snowball effect yes. of infidelity is can be a lifetime of it's it's a big cost. It's yeah. a big fee. Yeah, and a lot of it is. People don't think through the, the consequence. We don't think about a child. So most people who are having an affair are not thinking about a child. Yeah. They're thinking about themselves. This makes me happy. It's good to have this as an outlet, as an as an option. Maybe things aren't cool at home. Maybe maybe my wife is tired because she got to deal with Cheryl all day. I don't know. But <laughs> But at the end of the day, you don't think through those consequences. And one of the things that I spend time in the book is, okay, let's count the costs. So I spent about three chapters of just talking about the price, the cost. Have you thought about this? Something to consider all of the costs. And one of them is, you know, these children who are placed into this situation and the relationships that are severed and these multiple branches coming off of your tree. It's really, really something to consider before you cross that line. And not to mention the emotional damage you do to each other. Right. Yeah. So the emotional damage you've done if you if you're married, the emotional damage you've done to the side chick, if, if you know, or side, side slick. Yeah. Um, you know, and having to deal with the residuals of all of that. Yeah. So as we get older and even, you know, prayerfully going into marriage, people will get the book and they'll understand, um, especially as believers, that, you know, this isn't their direction for us to go. That mm-hmm. there's peace yeah. in finding joy in your marriage. What about what about? There's a there's a sense for you because your mom and dad were married that you're whole. Like I'm a whole child, but what what must it feel like to be that child? Like there, there's something broken about me. The way I was born, the way I was raised, the way I was nurtured, I was hidden. I was not desired. I was not wanted. They didn't plan for me. Like that can do something to your whole sense of self value for your entire life to have to overcome that I don't feel like I'm whole. The fracturing of infidelity, and I went through that because because of my father's infidelity and and the fact that he wasn't living with us, I never felt complete growing up. I was an adult before I figured it out, but I always wondered why I worked so hard to be accepted as a kid, trying to be funny, always extra, whether it was fighting or doing the extreme stuff, because I never felt whole. I always felt like his absence in the house made me incomplete. And I don't think he intended that, but that's the residual impact that it had on me. I never felt, even when my when my mother remarried and I had a stepfather, and he was light skinned, and people would make fun of me saying, "You know that red dude in the house ain't your father," and I would laugh like it wasn't no big deal, but I'd go in the house and cry, like, yeah. like look at something's wrong, like I'm something's wrong with my family, something's wrong with my house, and I think that's a real a real important issue to think of, the impact on children and generations and what it does to the person and how they reach out for love. I never felt like I was special. I felt like I was, I had to be accepted. That's tough. Wow. All of that comes out of, in, in a real sense, if we, if we take it down to its raw sense, it came out of cheating. I was 
this happened because I was unfaithful. And, and, and so what does that put a child? I mean, you have to intentionally love a child like that because it's not their fault, but it doesn't eliminate the consequences. And that is people feel like they're shattered, they're incomplete because of the way that they came into this world. I came in, I'm the result of somebody. I was, my mom was a side chick. My daddy's a side, my daddy cheated and that's how I got here. Like that's kind of like, so, oh, he couldn't be at my recital for Christmas because his daughter had one. And I couldn't spend holidays with him because he couldn't be there. So he would always come the day before or the day after or whatever. And and he was we spent our birthday alone. And I didn't get to meet my siblings till late. It's just so much. Or the ones who just don't even acknowledge the fact that I have these kids. Come on. on the side or, you know, or whatever. And, yeah. you know, so it really is a snow. What makes people turn from that because a lot of times you you know when people are cheaters they've been cheaters forever and it might be the residuals of like you said past childhood experiences or what they've experienced themselves what makes people turn away from cheating yeah yeah there's a saying true once a cheater always a cheater or is it not i i think if you cheat you lie if you lie you steal you don't yeah that you, that's what you is <laughs> what my angelo say when somebody show you who they are believe them. believe them. right I always believe that people will change because of one of three things happens. People will change when there's enough at stake that they feel they have to. There's got to be enough on the line that I can't afford to lose this. There's too much at stake. Because sometimes people are getting away with stuff and the consequences are not big enough. But they'll change when there's enough at stake that they, they say, I got to make a change. Or they change when they hurt enough they have to. Or when they grow enough they're able to. So sometimes I have to learn a new way. like. Because my, I can't, I can't behave at another level with the same level of information and development that I have. I can't just force myself to behave at another level. I've got to be developed and mentored, and I got to be willing to have the level of accountability in my life and support. And I think when those things are present, I've, I got enough at stake. For me, I didn't want to lose my ministry, my family. It's just when I counted the cost, this was going to be, the check was too high. I couldn't write the check. I couldn't write the check. I can't write the check of infidelity. The cost is too high. The pleasure doesn't, it doesn't catch up with the cost. So for me, that was important. The the, the hurt that it would cause, I, get, I, get, I gotta make a change. So it, it, it means introducing yourself to a world of accountability, like including your spouse. Like, like I have nothing to hide now. I wanna confess to you what I've done. Here's what I've done. Here's who I've been around. Here's who I've crossed the line with making yourself accountable to authority. I've, I've seen people do it. I've seen people come out of that and say, it ain't worth going back into it. Now, do they have to fight this the rest of their life? I think so. I think there's some things when you enter into that space, you have introduced yourself to a spirit that you're gonna have to come back the rest of your life. That if I had never entered into that space, it would be like, I might be curious, but now I only have to be curious. I know what that's like. I know why, and that's why it's so important that I, why I call it side chickology, because it's the study of infidelity. This is not just about, you know, some superficial look at it. Because I, I go into why people do it. Like if you know, you don't know how you got to a certain place, you can end up back there again. So understanding the pathology that got me or anybody else into this space, whether it's my own brokenness, my own feeling like I didn't measure up enough, my hunger for attention, like somebody's flirting can make you, like. Like there's a there's a space where if I'm that hungry or that thirsty, that a compliment will make me follow the person. And say, hey, how I look today? Like if somebody tell you you're cute and you if you ain't hearing that enough, at some point you gotta say I I'm cute. I'm gonna say that to myself. You know what I'm saying? You gotta have 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 to follow the pattern. What made me so vulnerable that I went down that pathway? And I think when all of those things are present, I think people can change and they do change. But it's gotta be a cost that they're not willing to pay. Like the cost has gotta be higher than the check they're willing to write. And and if that's the case, they're willing to go through a process to help them change and transform. And I think that can happen whether it's infidelity, it can be a gambling addiction, it can be a food addiction, it can be a drug addiction, an alcohol addiction. You know, people have to have to get to a point where it's gonna cost me too much. And I think a lot of people who are addicted to any kind of substance abuse or any kind of reckless behavior, the problem is the people around them will not leave them. 
they haven't hit rock bottom yet. They, right. These enablers have made it easy. Exactly. They keep saying, I'm sick of you. Don't you do this anymore. All they did, all they got to do is a mad person. You just mad, but you ain't going nowhere. They're not going to go home and everybody going to be gone. There's got to be something that they can lose and say, you know what? This ain't even worth another drink. This is not worth another side piece. This ain't worth another smoke. This ain't worth another crap game or blackjack game. You know what I'm saying? That's what it's got to come down to. And I think for somebody who's still addicted to reckless behavior, the cost hasn't got high enough yet. Because the people around them, as you say, don't even know they're continuing this perpetual behavior because there's got to be a consequence to make them stop. This is so good. We could make this into an hour show, but I can't do it. I, I can't do it. But what you should do is pick up this book, Side Chick, The Side Chickology. I like how this sounds. The Side Chickology, Why Men and Women Cheat. And uh, get the full perspective of it. Maybe you've gone through it. Maybe you're dealing with it now. Maybe, you know, um, you've cheated yourself. Maybe, you know, you're, you're a product of it. Um, this will help you. This will help you. Pastor Battle, thank you. Thank you you can't pastor the entire world, but you can do this. And this yeah. is good. You're yeah. absolutely right. Because I love I love the ministry. I love what you thank bring. You. Um, you bring an everyday perspective. You're not, you don't feel you don't feel like the type of pastor that's all the way over there. Like you're right there yeah, for the people you. of God, your delivery. And I sneak into the ministry sometimes. Oh, I just don't yeah, say that because you know. I don't want to you know hoopla of it all. VIP. I don't need all. Yeah, you a parking spot. So, yeah. <laughs> seat up in the front. Exactly. Holl it out. Shout but I love out. what you're doing here in the DMV and the many books. Make sure you get them. Tell everybody how to stay in and touch so, with you. So, yeah. For me, you can follow me on uh, Instagram at Keith Battle, uh, Facebook at Keith Battle, I'm on Twitter at Keith Battle. Um, you can get the book at Amazon. You can get it at uh, Book Baby, uh, Barnes and Nobles. You can get it at First Baptist Glen Arden if you're in the DMV. You can get it at Zion Church. Um, SagacityCompany.com is another place you can get it. S A G A C I T Y Company.com. You can order it there. Um, but get it, get it, download it. I help get this message out because we want to get it out to the world. That's why I did the cover the way I did it. I didn't want to just target black church folks. Because uh, I think it's a message for the world, and um, so your support means a lot. And and I don't think, and I'm not just trying to push something on you that won't help. I think, as you said, it's a helpful tool to That's a lot of awesome. people. Pastor Keith Battles on my author's corner today, right here at Praise 104.1.